This talk is about programmable networks. In recent years, there have been significant efforts, both from industry and the research community, to build networks that are easy to program. This is useful because it enables network operators to easily deploy new services for their customers. It also allows network researchers to test new ideas, new protocols in a realistic environment. One approach to building programmable networks is to do all the packet processing in software. In this approach, network devices are built using general purpose hardware that is commodity of the shelf servers. This brings a familiar programming environment and all the economic benefits inherited from a PC-based ecosystem, such as large volume manufacturing or cost reduction. <coughs> so software packet processing is an appealing way for building programmable networks where changing the network functionality is similar to performing software upgrades. However, there is something that network operators don't like about performing software packet processing. And that is unpredictable performance. The concern is that if you run multiple, more complex packet processing applications inside the same box, you will have unpredictable performance. An important reason for this concern is resource contention. When different applications share the same hardware infrastructure, they contend for shared resources, caches, memory controllers, buses, and this leads to performance interference that is hard to predict. Several research projects, Routebricks, Packet Shader, Server Switch, just to name a few, have achieved high performance for software packet processing. But this has been achieved in a limited setup where all the packets are subjected to the same kind of processing. For instance, IP forwarding or some particular form of encryption. This limited setup allows optimizing, configuring, provisioning the system for one particular well-studied workload. Instead, we want to have a software packet processing system that achieves high and predictable performance in the face of resource contention. This system is supposed to support a diverse set of packet processing applications, potentially developed by different entities and multiple clients with different needs. So let me show you a high level overview of our system. So we have a general purpose server, we have traffic coming in and going out, and in the middle we apply some forms of packet processing. <coughs> I show you here three parallel lines each of them corresponds to a different subset of the traffic that requires a different kind of packet processing. You can think of this as, well, you can think of one line as corresponding to a different set of users, for example. So we are targeting a flexible system. For instance, we may want to provide encryption for one subset of the traffic, collect statistics for a different subset of the traffic. And I should know that this is a nearly perfect parallel system. You can think of these processing flows as individual applications that do not interact with each other directly. The problem is resource contention. All these applications share the same hardware infrastructure and they contend for shared resources. <coughs> for example, if we add filtering for one subset of the traffic, this can result in an SLA violation for another subset of the traffic. And that's what network operators don't like about software packet processing the fact that it can lead to unexpected performance problems. When we first started to work on this, we thought that building such a system that provides the <coughs> predictable performance, it's a very hard job. And that's because in a general purpose system, predicting the effects of resource contention is very hard. Researchers have studied this problem for a long time. They have proposed sophisticated MAD models to predict the effects of contention. They have proposed sophisticated smart job scheduling in an attempt to alleviate the effects. And sometimes these techniques work, sometimes they don't. It is just too hard to capture all the corner cases with one technique. So achieving predictable performance in the face of resource contention is hard in a general context. But is it hard in the context of a packet processing system? We're expecting things to be complicated as well in the, in the context of a packet processing system but we are pleasantly surprised to find out that this is not the case. In this work, we show that it is feasible to build a packet processing system with predictable performance in the face of resource contention. We achieve this in a flexible system that supports different packet processing applications and multiple clients with different needs. We also show that sophisticated job placement does not bring significant benefit to the overall performance and may not be worth the effort in the context of packet processing. So things are simpler than someone would expect and we consider this to be good news for all the current efforts in the software networking community. For this talk, I will focus on the first contribution. I invite you to read the paper to find out more about the second one. I will start by presenting an overview of our system. 
I will tell you what is the main, what is the main contention factor in our system. Then I will make two key observations on the behavior of packet processing applications. I will show you how based on these two observations we can do simple yet accurate prediction of the contention effects. And in the end I will argue that our prediction should work on any modern packet processing system. So this is the picture I showed you before, our system. Let's see what are the packet processing applications that, that we use in our system. So to study the effects of resource contention, we implemented five realistic packet processing applications. We have standard IP forwarding using a realistic size routing table, a monitoring application, which in addition to IP collects per flow traffic statistics in a net flow style. We have redundancy elimination, an application that eliminates redundant, redundant traffic from the network. We also have a small firewall and VPN encryption. In our experiments, we also use a synthetic application for profiling. This application, for each packet it, re it receives, it performs a configurable number of CPU operations and a configurable number of random reads to a data structure that has the same size as the cache size. These applications cover a wide range of CPU and memory behavior. As you may already guess, some applications are more cache intensive because we can fit the data structures into the cache. Some are more memory intensive, some are more CPU intensive. So we choose this set of applications because they are already deployed in current network devices and they cover a wide range of CPU and memory behavior. Now let's have a closer look at our system. So we use a software packet processing system that is based on Linux and SMP Click and runs on top of a commodity Intel Xeon server. This is a dual socket Westmere server. Each socket has six cores. All the six cores of the same socket share a L3 cache, the memory controller, and the interconnect bus. Given this setup, we apply some basic configuration rules because they optimize the performance of our system and they avoid unnecessary contention. First, we run one application per core. In our system, one packet is always processed by a single core in order to minimize the number of compulsory cache misses. Second, we allocate the memory in a numaware fashion in order to minimize the memory access latency. This way applications always access their data from the local NUMA node, so there's no need to use the interconnect bus to transfer data. This separates the system into two different contention domains. Each application run, running on one contention domain can compete with five other competitors running on the same contention domain and only for the cache and the memory controller. This particular granularity at which, at which we dedicate resources simplifies our system and is a reasonable choice considering the con uh, current trends in general purpose hardware. I won't get into details here, but I'll be happy to discuss this in the end. So in our system, the contention factors are the cache and the memory controller. Now let's see what are the effects of resource contention in our system. We run the workloads on our system and this is what we observe. On the y-axis, we show the throughput drop suffered by one application due to contention relative to when there is no contention. The higher is the worse. On the x-axis, we have the application for which we measure the drop, while different colors represent different contention scenarios. To give you an example, the monitoring application suffers a 27% throughput drop when it competes with five redundancy competitors, whereas it suffers 10% throughput drop when it competes with five firewall competitors. You can see that some applications are significantly more aggressive than others. The light blue bars correspond to redundancy as a competitor, while the purple bars correspond to firewall as a competitor. You can see that the light blue bars are always higher than the purple bars. That means that redundancy inflicts more damage than the firewall. We also observe that some applications are significantly more sensitive than others. For instance, IP and monitoring suffer always more than the other applications. Their, their bars, the corresponding bars for IP and monitoring are always higher than the other bars. So the rest of this talk is about making sense out of this picture. Understanding what makes an application be sensitive or aggressive and how we can use this in order to accurately predict the performance. Now let's see what is the main contention factor in our system. <coughs> So it's either the cache or the memory controller. We use different tricks, job placements, memory allocations in order to expose contention for different resources. 
What I'm showing you here is the maximum drop of one application when competing with five synthetic competitors that perform only random cache reads at the highest rate possible. On the Y axis, we have the performance drop. On the X axis, we represent different contention scenarios. So let's look at the red bars. The monitoring application can suffer almost 40% when it's competing for both the cache and the memory controller. It suffers 32% when it's competing only for the cache, and it suffers 6% when it's competing only for the memory controller. What we can see here is that the dominant contention factor is the cache and not the memory controller. And that makes sense because state-of-the-art hardware provides large enough bandwidth for the memory, and our workloads don't have a lot of memory level parallelism. Now we look at application's behavior. We want to see if we can predict the performance drop of an application facing resource contention. Since the cache is the dominant contention factor, we characterize the aggressiveness of an application using the number of cache references per second. The intuition is that the more cache references performed by an application, the more aggressive it is, the, the more it pollutes the cache, the more damage it causes to other applications. We measure the performance drop suffered by one application when it competes with different sets of synthetic competitors. We use synthetic competitors that perform random cache reads and for which we vary the number of references, number of cache references per second that they perform. On the Y axis, we have the performance drop. On the X axis, we have the number of cache references per second performed by the competitors. For example, this is the drop curve we obtained for the monitoring application. The performance drop of the monitoring application is 24% when it competes with five synthetic competitors that perform 80 million references per second. So this is with synthetic competitors. Now let's see what happens when we have realistic competitors. On the same graph, we show the performance drops suffered by the monitoring application when it competes with realistic competitors. For example, the performance drop of the monitoring application is 27% when it competes with five redundancy elimination competitors. In this case, the five redundancy elimination competitors generate 80 million references per second. As you may see, the monitoring application suffers almost the same drop when competing with synthetic and realistic competitors that perform the same number of cache references per second. So it's 24% with synthetic competitors and 27% with realistic competitors. And that's the same for all scenarios involving realistic competitors. The individual points represent contention scenarios with realistic competitors and are pretty close to the drop curve obtained using synthetic competitors. So we make here our first observation. The aggressiveness of a set of competitors is mostly determined by their number of cache references per second and not so much by the type of competitors. We verify this observation for all our workloads. The drop curves are obtained using synthetic competitors the individual points are obtained using realistic competitors. For example, the green curve, the drop curve for the VPN, is obtained by running VPN with various synthetic competitors. The green points are obtained by running VPN with various realistic competitors. And indeed, in all cases, the individual points match closely the drop curves. The aggressiveness of a set of competitors is mostly determined by their number of cache references per second. Now let's have a look at the shape of the drop curves. So at first, we observe a steep drop as we increase the number of competing cache references per second. But beyond some point, the drop slows down significantly for the sensitive applications, those, those that suffer the most. So to give you an example, the monitoring application, the red curve, suffers a 20% performance drop when competition goes from zero to 50 million references per second, and only 5% more when competition goes from 50 to 100 million references per second. So we make here our second observation. For a sensitive application, the drop curve grows slowly after a certain point. Now I'll show you how based on these two observations, we can do a simple but accurate prediction of the contention effects. So in step number one, we run each application with different synthetic competitors that perform random cache reads and for which we vary the number of cache references per second. This way we obtain the performance drop curve for each application as a function of the competing cache references per second. In step number two, we measure the number of cache references per second performed by each application when running alone. In step number three, 
the predicted drop for one application is equal to the value of its drop curve corresponding to the sum of competing references per second. It's important to point out that this prediction method is based only on simple offline profiling. To, to understand better how it works, I will try to visualize it a little bit for you. So we try to predict the performance drop for one application. In step number one, we run the application with different synthetic competitors. We vary the number of cache references per second that they perform. And we obtain the performance drop curve. In step number two, we measure the number of cache references per second performed by each competing application when running alone. We sum up the number of references per second for all competitors. And let's say this is 100 million references per second in this case. In step number three, we intersect the drop curve with a vertical line passing through the point that we determine at step number two. The value of the drop curve in this point is the predicted drop. So that's pretty simple. In practice, the measured drop might be a little bit off. First, we assume that a set of realistic competitors will affect the application as much as a set of synthetic competitors that perform the same number of cache references per second. This is well supported by our observation number one, but still we might introduce some small errors. Second, we assume that each competitor will perform as many references per second as it does when it's running alone. In practice, the competitors will also suffer due to contention and they might perform fewer references. However, the error introduced is small because the observation number two, the drop grows slowly after a certain point. So the difference between the predicted drop and the measured drop is our prediction error. Our prediction method leverages our two observations and as we will see, the prediction errors are small. So how big are the prediction errors? On the y-axis, we show the difference between the predicted and the measured performance drop suffered by each application in different scenarios. For example, on, on the x-axis, we have the application for which we measure the prediction. Different colors represent different contention scenarios. For example, when monitoring competes with five IP competitors, we have a prediction error of 3%. When monitoring competes with five redundancy competitors, we have a prediction error of 2%. In general, the highest errors correspond to the red pink bars, the scenarios where we have five IP or five monitoring competitors. Here we overestimate the drop suffered by an application, partially because we assume the competitors will perform as many cache references per second as they do when they run alone. Actually, IP and monitoring are sensitive applications that do suffer because of contention and will perform fewer cache references per second compared to when they run alone. So in all scenarios, we observe that errors are smaller than 3%. The contention effects are predictable for our system. We spend a lot of time trying to understand why is this the case, whether or not our observations will hold in the future. So we observe that the aggressiveness of a set of competitors is mostly determined by their number of cache references per second. This is the picture I showed you before a set of realistic competitors and a set of synthetic competitors that uh, perform the same number of cache references per second cause roughly the same damage to a given application. We think this is because the total amount of memory accessed by the competitors far exceeds the size of the cache, which causes the cache access to be close to uniform. We expect this to hold for packet processing systems for two reasons. Reason number one, any interesting packet processing application will access at least a few megabytes of data. Think of a realistic size routing table or think about any application that needs to keep per flow state. Reason number two, in state of the, in state of the art general purpose hardware, we have no more than two, three megabytes of shared cache per core. And this is expected to stay, to stay the same because if you increase the cache space too much, you also increase the latency to access that cache. The second observation, the drop curve for a sensitive application grows slowly after a certain point. This is the picture I showed you before. The monitoring application suffers 20% drop when competition goes from zero to 50 million references per second. And only 5% more when competition goes from 50 to 100 million references per second. When applications compete for the cache, most of the damage ha happens early on. 
Imagine that you have an application running without competition, so it has all the cache to itself. Now we introduce competitors and slowly increase the number of cache references that they perform. At first, each reference performed by the competitors is very likely to evict our application's data. But as we increase the rate of competing references, a cache reference performed by the competitors is also likely to evict the competitors' own data, its own data. And this can be shown with very simple probabilistic analysis that we have in the paper. So none of these observations are particular to our Intel platform, and we expect these observations to hold for any modern packet processing system. Having seen the intuition behind our results, let me conclude the talk. And I will conclude by summarizing our results. So in this work, we show that it is feasible to build a packet processing platform with predictable performance in the face of resource contention while only using simple techniques. We achieve this in a flexible system that supports different packet processing applications and multiple clients with different needs. We also show that sophisticated job placement does not bring significant benefit to the overall performance and may not be worth the effort in the context of packet processing. We argue that these results are not artifacts of our setup and they should hold for any modern system that runs packet processing applications. Now I'd like to thank you and I would be happy to take questions. Yeah, Chuck from NEC Labs. Uh, have you looked at the work called Bubble Up from University of Virginia published in ISCA 2010, I think? Uh, the work actually does very similar things, not in the context of networking, but the same setting, single node, multiple applications, cache, memory controller, interference. That's point one. Second, now in your example, uh, depending on the size of the data, for example, encryption, time could change. So have you varied the size of input data in your example and see how it affects your results? So the first question was about well, the First was a comment. I, I think you should look at a paper called Bubble Up in the ISCA 2010 proceedings from University of Virginia. Okay. And uh, to me, while I was going through the talk, it looked identical. So take, take a look at it. Please take a look at it. The second question is, have you examined the uh, implication on the data size, input data size? Um, okay. So it shouldn't matter too much. So it depends depends on the application, of course. So for encryption, it it will depend on the data size that you put in, of course. Right. So will your results be different prediction errors? And all? I think the 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 results should hold, should hold. I expect the results to hold. I think so. Our method has nothing to do with the, the input of the data, data input. I don't think. Right. So, Thanks. OK, maybe to clarify, now I understand. So for a given application, we assume some given workload. And we predict the performance assuming that given workload. If the workload is different, you, you are required to do a different profiling and a different prediction. But usually, like operators, they they, they provision their resources for a given workload. It's not like you can provision for any workload that you get. Now, every new application you introduce, you have to characterize it again com from scratch? Yes, but you can profile each application in isolation, so you don't have right. to run multiple groups of applications or different combinations. You take each application, you profile it, you determine the drop curve and the number of references per second that they perform, uh, that it performs to the cache. And then this is the only thing that you need. The rest, you can just do it using simple, a simple C program that computes the prediction. Thank you. Ashok Anand from Bell Labs. So my question was related to like applications like RE where, you know, that like uh, the cache message is very much dependent on the traffic. How much is the redundancy you're finding, like whether most of the redundancy is happening within a small time window, whether most of the things are happening can, can in the case. Speak, can you speak rare, more rarely? Yeah, so basically I'm saying that uh, like uh, the cache misses property is very much dependent on the uh, traffic pattern, right? For applications like RE, right? So, yeah. you know, how do you do it like, you know, 
I mean, you, when, you, when you say that you will do it offline, you will probably uh, do it in like some isolation. So I'm wondering, you know, like, how will you, you know, predict this kind of a cache message behavior for applications like RE, where things are very much dynamic? Things can be very much dynamic. Sure. So we predict the performance assuming a given workload. Now, if you want to predict the, the performance for a given application that is highly dependent on that, you can assume some works, worst case scenario. So you can send the worst case traffic that you would expect and you'll profile using that. So, okay, uh, another question was like, uh, I mean, what do you do like, you know, for this cache misses? I mean, you don't really have much control, right? So. You don't have what? You don't have any much control of like, you know, saying that, okay, I mean, this is, I'm ensuring that the performance is not going to be worse by this factor. Can you repeat that question? Yes, so you can predict for. Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, Rishi from UC San Diego. Uh, so, this question is slightly away from what you presented today. It's more on that. Uh, so, in your pr uh, work right now, what you presented is you didn't consider the performance variation due to uh, packet path from the NIC to the application. So, do you have some numbers that? the performance degradation due to this packet path is not high as compared to the res application resource contention? So this depends on the application, but the software packet processing platforms are meant to do more interesting packet processing. So as soon as you start doing some more fancy processing, some sophisticated kind of processing, the latency of transferring the packet from the NICs to the core is not that high compared to the time it takes to, to, to process the packet, like the trips that you do to the memory, the number of cache misses and such. Right, but when you include things like interrupts, polling, uh, that affect a lot of performance. That basically brings a lot of performance variation in general software uh, processing, in general packet processing. Like there are a lot of interrupts, your core would be descheduled and your performance would be varied. So did you have, do you so have some sort of numbers like this is not your bottleneck and the application resource contention is the actual bottleneck? Yes, yes, so it depends on the workload. If you use some simple kind of processing uh, and if you send like large packets, for example, you can get to have IO bottleneck. But in this case, we assume that you're not bottlenecked by the IO you are bottlenecked at the CPU. So if you send small size packets or if you send, if you do some more sophisticated kind of processing, you'll be bottlenecked at the CPU. So we have a, an analysis in the Broadbricks paper where we show that for small, for small packets, you are bottlenecked by the CPU. For large packets, you are bottlenecked by the IO. Okay. Uh, do you have any performance variation uh, numbers, like something like this, like how much your performance varies when you pick different uh, of these applications. Maybe we can take this offline. Okay. Uh, Mark Andley, University College London. Um, I guess several of us are asking variants of the same question, but um, I'll ask it again. Um, are there applications for which it's really, really hard to characterize their um, number of cache accesses per second? I mean, the, the ones that come to mind are ones where the, the memory accesses are strongly under the influence of the data traffic itself. So something like intrusion detection, where the data structures and the size of the data structures are, are determined not by the operator, but by the data traffic. And so you can't really characterize them very easily. And I wonder how many applications might fall into that category, whether you've thought of any. So again, we predict the performance assuming a given workload. So you have the application, you have the input, and you characterize based on that. Now, if the workload changes, that's different. So what you can do, you can send the worst case traffic. Mm -hmm. And if it's a I, I, of, we help you to provision the resources for the worst case traffic, sort of. 
Well, if it's a factor of something like two between the worst case and the average case, that's fine. But if it's a couple of orders of magnitude and so forth, then it stops becoming very useful to you. I mean, the real predictions are then two orders of magnitude out in terms of the normal case. So I would expect to, to work with any kind of packet processing application as long as you know the workload. Okay, so applications that you don't know the workload, which might be quite a lot, it doesn't work for. Is that, am I misphrasing you, what you said? Usually you provision resources for some assumed workload, right? I mean. Okay, okay. fair enough. <laughs> 